This is part two on The Starvation Doctor. For Tammy Swift's original stories on this topic, visit inforum.com. Just look for the vault section. Sheltered, wealthy, and enamored with alternative medicine, Dorothy and Claire Williamson were the perfect marks for Linda Hazard, an osteopath turned fasting fanatic. The British sisters were both in their 30s. They had wealth and a life of leisure, which made it possible to travel wherever they wanted. They were orphaned at a young age. The siblings had grown especially close and came to view themselves as their own little family unit. Dorothy, also called Dora, saw herself as the mother figure, treating Claire, just four years younger, like a pampered child. The Williamsons had another peculiarity. They were hypochondriacs. Although nothing was seriously wrong with them, they were sure they weren't well. Dora talked of swollen glands and rheumatic pains, while her younger sister was told by a physician that she had a dropped uterus. They began seeking answers in alternative treatments, giving up corset wearing and meat eating in their quest for wellness. While staying at a posh hotel in British Columbia, the sisters spotted an ad for Linda Hazard's book, Fasting for the Cure of Disease. Linda had left her first husband behind in Fergus Falls to move to Minneapolis in 1898 and practice as an osteopath. She had become convinced that fasts were the only solution to perfect health. But her methods were so extreme that some patients died rather than improved. Perhaps in an effort to avoid repercussions in Minneapolis, she and her second husband, Samuel Hazard, had relocated to Washington to start Hazard's Institute of Natural Therapeutics in the tiny town of Olala. The Williamsons knew little of the more unsavory details of Linda's past. When they received her book, they read it voraciously. Claire grew convinced that Linda's institute was the only solution to their various ills. She raved of Linda's beautiful treatment. The sisters had formed a romantic vision of what it would be like to spend time in Linda's country sanitarium. They dreamed of horses grazing in the fields, vegetable broths made from the produce fresh from nearby markets. That's according to Smithsonian Magazine. But when the sisters arrived in Seattle in February 1911, the sanitarium wasn't ready. Instead, they rented an apartment in Seattle, where Linda prescribed that they eat only one cup of unseasoned tomato or asparagus broth, made from canned vegetables, twice daily. They also sometimes got tiny sips of orange juice. Linda also pummeled them with violent osteopathic treatments and ordered their nurses to give them hours-long enemas. When the weakened women started fainting during the painful procedures, Linda ordered their nurses to install a canvas sling across the tub to catch them when they fell. The Williamsons wasted down to 70 pounds. Their clothes hung on them as if they were little girls wearing adult women's gowns. Their faces were so gaunt that when they smiled, they resembled leering skulls. That's according to Greg Olson the author of Starvation Heights. They fainted constantly. They could no longer walk any significant distance, so they had to be carried. When Linda gleefully announced that the sanitarium was finally ready, the sisters were carried down the stairs to twin ambulances. Dora's appearance was so disturbing that nurses swaddled her hands and head in bandages to deter curious onlookers. If the sisters were even lucid enough to notice it, they likely were disappointed by the reality of Linda's country sanitarium. It was a muddy, tree-shrouded, 40-acre tract with a simple frame house where the hazards lived and five tiny, shoddily built cabins, which Olson described as barely sufficient to house chickens. Even before the sisters had come to Olala, Linda had grown increasingly more intrusive about their financial affairs. Would they like to give her their jewels so she could lock them up for safekeeping? Perhaps she could have an attorney draw up an update to their wills. In their current state, did they need some help managing their money and property? She repeatedly told Claire that Dora could no longer take care of them. She said she had lost her mind. Brainwashed and weak from severe malnutrition, 
the Williamsons relented. They were all alone, with Linda keeping them apart so they couldn't talk to each other. They had come to the fasting farm without telling relatives. They were afraid others would scoff at the sisters' latest health fad. No one knew where they were. Despite it all, they remained hypnotized by Linda Hazard. Even if they were offered food, they wouldn't eat a crumb without her okay. It wasn't until Claire sent a desperate cable halfway around the world to the sister's childhood nurse, Australian-born Margaret Conway, that someone finally came to their aid. The cable contained just eight words. Come, SS, Marama, May 8th, First Class, Claire. The message was so cryptic that Conway knew something was wrong. She booked the first available berth on the Marama and headed to the Pacific Northwest. Upon her arrival in Vancouver on June 1st, 1911, she was greeted by Samuel Hazard, who was there to accompany her back to Olala. When Conway asked how the girls were doing, Samuel responded as if giving a weather report. Miss Claire is dead and Miss Dora is helplessly insane. I am sorry. As Margaret Conway sat there and wept, Samuel Hazard did his best to ignore her. When the grieving governess was taken to Seattle Mortuary to view Claire's body, she was struck by how little it looked like the young woman she knew so well. Everything from her hair color to the corpse's hands looked wrong. Later, prosecutors would surmise that the Hazards had bribed the funeral home to switch out Claire's body with a healthier looking one. They also believed that when Claire was on her deathbed, The Hazards had gotten her to sign a document which consented to cremation. Linda seemed anxious to share the results of an autopsy she'd taken the liberty to perform on the body first. She claimed Claire's demise not on the fact that she hadn't eaten for 80 days, but on drugs administered to her in childhood, which Linda claimed had shrunk her internal organs and caused cirrhosis of the liver. When Conway finally got to the Institute to see Dora, She was appalled to find her mistress had dwindled down to 50 pounds. Her sitting bones protruded so much that she found it excruciating to sit. Conway begged Dora to leave the Institute, but even after losing her beloved sister, Dora still seemed to believe in Linda. She refused. Conway felt she could only do so much as a servant from a class-conscious background. The nanny did what she could sneaking rice and cream into the starving woman's broth in efforts to give her nutrition. But she knew Dora would die soon if someone with clout didn't intervene. One day, after the Hazards left the Institute to catch a boat, Conway raced to the nearest store and sent a cable to Dora's uncle, John Herbert, who lived in Portland. Horrified, he hurried to free his niece. He haggled with Linda for hours before grudgingly paying the doctor nearly a thousand dollars to secure his niece's freedom. He and Conway also discovered Linda had made herself executor of Claire's estate, as well as Dora's guardian for life. Dora had also signed over power of attorney to Samuel Hazard. The Hazards also helped themselves to Claire's wardrobe of expensive silk dresses, as well as $6,000 worth of the sister's diamonds and other precious gems. Linda Hazard even wore one of Claire's dressing gowns around the house, in full view of Dora and her former nanny. If not for the intervention of British authorities, Linda Hazard might have walked free. C.E. Lucian Agassiz, a British vice consul in Tacoma, took an interest in what had happened to the British sisters. He was able to free Dora from guardianship and ultimately instigated a court case against Linda Hazard. As Agassiz and John Herbert investigated the sanitarium, they found a trail of wealthy patients who had died under Linda's care. Some signed over large sections of their estate to the Hazards. One of them, a former state legislator named L.E. Rader, owned the land on which the sanitarium was built. Rader died in May 1911 after dwindling down to under 100 pounds on his 5-foot, 11-inch frame. While still alive, he had been moved to a secret location before authorities could question him. Another British citizen, John Ivan Flux, had come to America to buy a ranch, but died with just $70 in his name after the hazard treatment. A New Zealand man reportedly shot himself while under Linda's care. (music) 
On August 15, 1911, Kitsap County authorities arrested the fasting specialist on charges of first-degree murder for Claire's death. That January, spectators crammed into the county courthouse in Port Archard to hear servants and nurses testify about the brutality endured by the Williamsons. Prosecutors also highlighted the financial starvation that had depleted the sister's fortune. As far as Linda Hazard was concerned, the trial was an attack on her position as a successful woman who dared to practice alternative methods in a male-dominated field. But jurors were unmoved. They deliberated for only a short while before returning with a guilty verdict of manslaughter. Linda was sentenced to two to 20 years of hard labor at the penitentiary in Walla Walla, and her medical license was revoked. Letters asking for Linda's release followed. That included a New Zealand petition bearing 121 names, in which signers implored the state to look upon Dr. Linda's methods of treatment as a boon to suffering humanity. An appeal was made to the Supreme Court, but it was rejected. After a year and a half in prison, Linda was pardoned by Governor Ernest Lister with the stipulation that she leave America. She and Samuel set sail for New Zealand, where she worked as a physician, dietitian, and osteopath, and published another book. They did so well overseas that they were able to return to Olala in 1920 and build an even greater sanitarium with three floors, a long porch that spanned the front of the building, and a grand staircase. Since Linda was no longer licensed to practice medicine, she called the sanitarium a, quote, school of health, and her patients, students. She continued to skirmish with the law, once for practicing medicine without a license while starving a Washington farmer to death. She was fined $100. The school burned down in 1935 under what some thought were suspicious circumstances. Linda Hazard died three years later at age 70 while attempting a fast cure on herself. You've been listening to The Vault, a forum communications podcast covering true crime and general intrigue in the Upper Midwest. For more stories, visit inforum.com. Just look for The Vault section.